and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we take a look at the news and top selling Spectrum games from June 1986. I compare Battlezone clones. I review some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Jeff Neal gives us another hidden gem. Jason continues his game development. And we take a look at some serious software. But first, the news. Supplies of the Sinclair microdrive cartridges are stable, at least for the moment. The buyout, along with Amstrad's export of the older machines, had many users worried that supplies would dry up. Several companies, including the manufacturer Abex, have large quantities though, but the long-term future of these storage devices is still uncertain. Demark have been politely asked to rename their new puzzle game, Splitting Images, by the creators of the TV series, Spitting Image. Demark say they are too small to take on the company, but have laughed off the issue. They are, however, going to rename their package, Split Personalities, just in case. Sinclair's plans for its new portable Spectrum compliant computer, the Pandora, has hit problems, mostly connected with the recent buyout. The heralded inclusion of a flat screen has now been shelved in favour of the more conventional LCD displays. The decision was thought to have been influenced by problems with viewing angles of Sinclair's technology. Also, now that Amstrad owned the rights to the Spectrum, making the Pandora compatible is also unlikely. Amstrad's first Spectrum computer has now started to be built by Timex in Dundee, the same company who previously built other Spectrum models. Scheduled for launch in September, the machine's specifications have now been finalised. It will include a built-in tape deck. This should remove the issues of loading errors, but does raise the issue with what happens if it breaks. It will also have 128K of RAM, and like the Amstrad CPC range, have a full proper keyboard. Joystick ports, RS-232 ports and MIDI ports are also included, all for a cost of around £140. As reported last month, several companies were looking to take the QL and take it forward with new designs and upgrades. The main one being CST, who were looking to produce their machine called Thor. Amstrad, however, have now decided that they will not allow the use of their technology by other companies. Since the Sinclair buyout, Amstrad owned the rights to the QL and will block anyone attempting to build machines using hardware based on the design. Another twist to the story sees Samsung claiming they own the rights to produce the circuit boards, but again Amstrad are disputing this. There is also selling rights that appear to be a real farce. Amstrad have the rights to sell anywhere in the world apart from Portugal and Mexico, where Timex take over. However, Timex have the rights to sell to Poland and Eastern Bloc countries, meaning there are alternative routes to obtain QL hardware. This will keep the lawyers busy for a while at least. And now on to the top selling games. Coming into the charts this month is Nighttime, the third outing for Magic Knight by Mastertronic. Rock and Wrestle, the ring crazy fight game from Melbourne House. Ninja Master, yet another ninja game from Firebird. Pentagram, Ultimate's latest release. World Cup Carnival, the old Arctic game re-released due to programmer issues by US Gold. And Ghosts and Goblins, the terrible arcade clone from Elite. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from June 1986. Battlezone was released into the arcades in 1980 by Atari, and like previous games by the company, used vector graphics to depict the action. The idea was simple, guide your tank around a landscape, avoiding blocks or using them to hide behind, and shoot other tanks, flying saucers and missiles, and of course, avoid being blown up yourself. You had a radar showing the positions of other tanks, and a unique control system allowing you to control both tank tracks independently, just like the real thing. Some arcade cabinets used a periscope to give a greater feel of realism. So, how would the Spectrum cope with all of this? Mm. 
we start with the officially licensed version produced by Quicksilver in 1984. As you would expect, this version is pretty close to the arcade. Each tank track is controlled individually, if you are using the keyboard, and all the features are there. Apart from, sadly, the animated volcano, but that doesn't really affect gameplay. There are less blocks scattered about in the landscape, so when moving forwards or backwards, you don't really get the feeling of depth. There is the continuous drone of the engine, and various effects that try to mimic the arcade machine. The wireframe graphics are nice and smooth, considering it's a 3.5 MHz processor doing all of the work. The colour scheme is not quite right, using magenta for the top panel rather than red of the arcade, but that's not really a bad point. Overall, this is quite close to the arcade version, and is very playable. The flying saucers and missiles are all included, and there aren't any real issues. The other games will really struggle to match this one. Next we have Combat Zone, released by Arctic in 1983. The display differs from the arcade game on several points, but the main omission is the landscape. Instead of the mountains and volcano, there's just a line of dots. This means that sideways movement is less noticeable, but there are more blocks around on the landscape which does help convey movement. The other difference are the colours. Instead of the plain green, Combat Zone draws the tanks in cyan, and the gun sights in magenta. The control panel includes a radar so you can locate the enemy, but when you line them up for a shot, they quickly move. This makes the gameplay very tricky, much more difficult than the arcade version. After 10 shots and a few minutes of playing, I still hadn't hit anything. Compared to the arcade, when my first shot took out a tank, as did my next three and four. So I decided to dive straight in and use different tactics, which seemed to work. To actually shoot anything, you have to be almost touching them, so that they can't move away. This changed the gameplay from the original, but once you get used to it, it's not bad, and I had quite a few enjoyable games. The sound is okay, and the controls are basic left, right, forwards and backwards. There's no option for independent track control. Not a bad game then, but a little too difficult to start with, I think. Next we have 3D Desert Patrol, released by CRL in 1983. Now this game moves away from the vectors, to give a more solid look. The control panel is at the bottom of the screen instead of the top, and gameplay is also slightly different. You have to get to safety whilst avoiding minefields and other tanks. As you move, the distance slowly ticks down, or, if you have to move to avoid minefield, can actually tick up. You are also given just 50 shells. Gameplay is a bit dull really, with lots of driving around in silence, avoiding tanks instead of shooting them, and just watching the distance meter tick down slowly. After 5 minutes of playing, I just didn't want to complete it. There was no excitement, and relatively no challenge. Some may ask if this is a real battle zone contender, and I suppose it could be taken out at a push, but it's close enough for me. Next we have a more modern game, Heavy Metal, released by US Gold in 1990. Now, here we have another game that could easily be missed out, but to be honest I was struggling trying to find enough clones for this feature, so here it is. The radar is present, plus you get a kind of zoom view so you can actually see what you're shooting at in the distance. The lower graphics panel show your view from your tank, and you have to spin around looking for targets, and then head off towards them. The window gives a good feeling of movement, but things do slow down when there's a lot happening on screen, and this is reflected in the engine noise. Once you line up the enemy, they appear at the top zoom view, and you then have to raise or lower your gun to get the right trajectory. If you're moving at the time, it also becomes more difficult, because you have to continually adjust the height of your gun whilst at the same time approaching the target. The other tanks fire back too, so you have to be careful. This isn't a terrible game, it's just a bit awkward to get to grips with.
on to the next game then, and Rommel's Revenge, released by Crystal Computing in 1983. The first thing you notice is the colour scheme. It's blue. The next thing is the landscape. To me it looks more like Lords of Midnight than Battlezone, but at least there's an animated volcano. On to the game, and there's a nice variety of blocks and things that you can't shoot that give the feeling of movement as you trundle about the landscape. These include radar stations, triangles, and what look like telegraph poles. The radar works well, but movement isn't as smooth as some of the other games. Sound is a bit of a letdown too, with only sounds for firing, and nothing else. This means you'll be mostly playing in silence. Gameplay-wise, it's not too bad, and the best part is knowing that when a tank has fired by the short blip sound, you have to try and get away as quickly as you can. You can do this by moving away at an angle, or hiding behind something. You then have to try and outmaneuver the enemy to get your shot in. To be honest, it's all a bit dull without sound, and not a game I would come back to. Next, we have Red Scorpion, released by Quicksilver in 1987. Now, this is quite a complex game with a complex story and lots of things to remember. There are options to request fire support, to identify objects, to arm missiles, and a whole lot more. The screen has selectable icons and a variety of things providing information. To be honest, I think it's a much more involved strategy game than Battlezone, but the gameplay is very similar, with a lot of other things layered over the top. Before you shoot anything, it's best to identify it first, otherwise you can get into trouble and the game ends. So you have to drive around, pick something that looks like it needs to be shot, identify it, and if it is, shoot it. If it isn't, move along and find something else. Before long, however, your fuel runs out, and you will have achieved absolutely nothing. The graphics look nice and smooth, and sound is okay, but I think there's just too much stuff thrown on top to try and make it a little bit more complex for arcade players to really enjoy. If you have the time to learn all of the commands and what they do, and to immerse yourself in the story, then it might be a totally different game, and one worth looking at. But for pure arcade fans, I'd give this one a miss. On to the last game then, and 3D Tank Duel from Real Time Software, released in 1984. Back into the proper clones then. And here we have a decent version of the game. The graphics have been changed with a solid landscape and even an animated volcano. The other graphics are all wireframe and move very smoothly. There's not individual track control, which is a pity, so you just get backwards, forwards, left and right. There are various different tanks, and all of these are shown during the attract mode, and there's also missiles and flying saucers. The top of the screen has the radar that works well, despite not being smoothly animated, but apart from that, nearly every aspect of the arcade game is here. Sound-wise, there's a rather annoying continuous blip sound as you play, but there are some nice firing and explosion sounds. The difficulty level was a bit high for me, and most of your time is spent trying to avoid enemy fire, rather than lining up your own shots. That said, it's a good version of the game, and provided a good strong challenge. With that, that's the end of these tests. So, which game can claim the Battlezone crown? There's really no contest. It has to be the official conversion from Quicksilver. This is almost identical to the arcade machine, and is well coded and nice to play. This is Kickboxing, released by Firebird Software in 1987. There's a flimsy story behind the game that tells of a challenger failing to turn up for a championship fight, and so members of the audience are asked if they want to have a go. Yeah, just like the real thing then. So you step up and try to defeat Mick the Meat Kicker. Well, 
once you have entered your name, which you have to do for every game, you are thrown into the action. Two well-drawn fighters are shown on the screen in a sort of 3D fashion, with endurance meters at the bottom for each player. Using the keyboard or joystick, you move around, defend and attack as you see fit. The combination of directions plus fire allows for a variety of moves such as ducking, punching and kicking at different heights, and of course, running away like a coward. The instructions don't really say how to interpret the endurance meters, and whether you should try to deplete your opponent or preserve your own, or in fact, which one is yours. After a few games, I think the top one represents you, because when it gets empty, the game ends. The gameplay is a bit tedious, to be honest. You move around and occasionally dive in for a bit of a scuffle, and then back off. You can jump straight in, and just try to outfight your opponent, but if you do this, you best keep an eye on that meter, otherwise you'll end up flat on your back. The sound is a bit sparse, with just thud noises when you do anything, but the graphics are nicely drawn, and the backgrounds look really good too. To move on, you have to beat the opponent three times, and when you do this, you move on to the next level, which has different background graphics. But no matter what I did, I couldn't get past the first fighter. I had to revert to using a poke to stop the opponent's endurance from replenishing, which allowed me to move on to the next level. As for the game then, it's average at best if you like this style of game, but I think there should be more instructions, and it should have a little bit easier learning curve. One for fight fans only then. Volcanic Dungeon was first released by Carnell Software in 1983, and subsequently re-released as an improved version by Master Vision a year later. I will cover the updated version later on, but let's start with the original. When I first got this game from an online store, it had in between the pages of the manual what I thought was a game map, but it turned out to be something much more useful. The game map is actually in the manual anyway, but the hand-drawn sheet was in fact a cross-reference of weapons and monsters, and I'll get on to why that's important very shortly. The story is very long and complex, and includes lots of battles and wars, and a princess being captured, and held prisoner in the volcanic dungeon, and of course it's your job to go and rescue her. When you begin, the dungeon is built, and this takes about 30 seconds. Get used to this though, as the game kicks you back here after every little mistake. Once the game does start, you have an entirely text-based view with very brief location descriptions, strength and water counts, plus a sort of small inventory with user-definable graphics. Single key commands are used, with no need to press enter, so pressing E for example will take you east. As you move about, various things appear, including weapons and monsters, and of course treasure. Each weapon has a distinct ability, and are best used against specific monsters, and this is where the sheep provided a real time saver. It listed all of the weapons and how they can be used against each of the monsters. When you meet a monster, which will be very often, you have to choose an item to fight with. You also have to choose an item to defend with. So for example, you want to fight with a sword and defend with a shield. Keeping track of all the possibilities would be a mammoth task, which is why the sheet is very useful. It doesn't help improve the game though, sadly, as there are many other things about it that should not be there. Moving around you find items and bump into monsters. You then get a chance to move or fight, keeping in mind that the monsters block certain directions. This means that you find yourself moving around quite a lot, looking for items before you can even begin to start fighting. Moving in the direction the monster is blocking, which is the same direction as you last used, results in the end of the game. You get kicked back to the start and have to wait another 30 seconds. What makes things even more difficult is that you can actually fall off of the game map. And if you do this, the game ends, and you get kicked back to the start again. To stop yourself doing this, you have to use the map provided, and keep within the bounds of all the tunnels and caves. Each object is represented by a single letter and a small graphic, so you have to keep looking at what each of these are, until you get used to them, and it's not always easy. For example, the sword is represented by the letter S, 
and a small picture, but the shield is represented with the letter I. All very odd. So, to sum everything up, you move around a fixed game map, collecting items that will enable you to survive encounters with various monsters. If you die, you have to rerun the game, from the start, so that it can re-randomise all the positions of the items and the monsters. This is very annoying and wastes yet another 30 seconds. Things get even worse though, and should you get far enough into the game and make changes that cannot be reversed, you actually have to reload the whole game from scratch, which takes about 4 minutes. I played this game for ages, using the smart card to reload when required, but it was still a pain to have to do all this over and over again. The idea is good, but it's not well executed, which is a shame. I always wanted to play this game after seeing the adverts, it sounded cool, but in reality it proves to be slow and uninteresting, unless you like plotting positions on maps, recording all possessions and testing every item against every monster for both fighting and defending. On to the updated version then. This version adds graphics, and a different font that's sometimes very difficult to read. The room graphics are helpful, but you would still need the map in case you fell off the end. And yes, you still have to sit through the building of the dungeon in the first place, and every time you make a mistake. The game seems almost identical in play, with the same problems and same sluggish response, although you are told which direction you just moved in, which is a slight improvement. Some inputs, particularly picking up items, can sometimes stop working, and you have to jab the key quite a few times before it actually responds. The game also seems to move things about during play, so you can move east and then move back west to discover an item is now in the place that you've just left. You can use this as a sort of cheat if you want, and I built up about 6 or 7 items using this method. This is the better of the two games though, with the added graphics and better messaging. There does seem to be a lot more monsters around though, and almost every room or tunnel will have something to fight and run away from. Sadly for me, I spent most of my playing time running away, and when I did fight something, my sword and shield got damaged in the first round, so I had to run away anyway. Oh well, I'm certainly glad I didn't buy this when it was released, or in fact re-released. One for the die-hard fans then, I think. X equals Y equals Z was released by Bob Stuff in 2014. X equals Y equals Z is somewhat of a unique game that really challenges your brain. The idea is simple, guide a square block around different pathways using a variety of limited controls. In a way it plays quite like Lemons, but without the rushed feel. You are presented with a 3D pathway a start point and an end point, and when you are ready, a block will appear and start moving. To guide it to the end point, you have to place various blocks in its path to make it change direction, slide, twist or teleport. The blocks you have to do this with are limited for each level, giving you just enough to complete it, so you have to work out which one to use at which point. Each of the block types are selected using a series of icons at the bottom of the screen, and you can undo these if you make any mistakes. Once you are confident that you've got it right, you can set the block on its way. There are 34 levels progressively getting harder, and some of the later levels really do screw with your mind. The graphics really suit the game, and are clean and crisp to look at, and move very well. Sound 2 suits the game, and there are a few nice tunes scattered about to brighten things up. This is a great game if you like puzzlers, and it will quickly eat up time before you even know it. Give this one a try. Hello and welcome to Hidden Gems. In this section we take a look at some games that aren't as well known but are still superb and well worth picking up and playing even today. 
Today we're going to take a look at Split Personalities by Dumog. Split Personalities was actually originally released as Splitting Images, again in 1986, but when it was originally released, the makers of Spitting Image went to court and got the release stopped, claiming that the name was far too similar to Spitting Image and it infringed their copyright. So Dumark pulled that original release and then re-released it as Split Personalities. Interestingly enough, Dumark actually, a few years later, released a game of Spitting Image, which was nothing like this. It wasn't anything like it at all. I, I think, I've never played it, but I think it may have been a beat-em-up. I think it may have been two pieces player beat-em-up where the characters from Spitting Image actually would fight against each other. This game is kind of similar to those sliding 2D puzzles that you used to get when you were a kid. So the sliding 2D puzzles, you'd have an image and it would be segmented into a number of squares and there'd be one square missing and you could move the squares around and of course jumble the image up and the idea was you jumble it up and then you had to try and put it right. That's the kind of things that kids used to play on to amuse themselves before the days of mobile phones and Game Boys and PSPs and things like that. So this game is similar to those puzzles in that you have a number of squares that you move around a grid. But it's got a bit of a Sokoban type game play mechanic as well in that these squares will move until they hit something and when they hit something they stop. To begin with the grid starts off empty, there's nothing in the grid and you have a kind of box of stacked up squares in the top left hand corner. You move your cursor over to that and press fire and various tiles will then come flooding out of the box. What you then need to do is arrange these tiles into the right order. Now to get bonuses there are additional squares that can combine together to give you good things. There are also bombs that come out of the box and if a bomb comes out and you haven't removed it from the grid by the time the fuse gets to the bomb it blows up and takes one of your lives. That can be very very annoying. The other way that you can lose a life in this game is if you run out of time. So there's a time limit for you to complete the picture and if you don't complete the picture within the time limit you die and towards the end when you're getting low on time it does a kind of ticking countdown which again can actually be quite annoying. It's, it's useful but it really ramps up the panic in this game. To move the tiles around you simply move your cursor over them, press the fire button and then move the direction you want the tile to move in. There are some other gameplay mechanics as well. The area has at the four midpoints of its walls sliding doors that open and close and you can remove a tile from the gameplay area by pushing it out of one of those doors while this is open. There are also what can only be described as cracks that appear around the walls of the playing area and if one of your tiles hits one of these cracks it will bounce back and the crack will become permanent for the rest of your game. So you won't be able to push a tile onto that particular piece of wall in that way again during your entire game and that again can be really really annoying. Now I know what you must be thinking at this point. All I've said so far is that X, Y and Z in the game is really really annoying. If you die because of a bomb it's annoying, if you crack the side of the screen so you can't play quite as well that's annoying. But despite these things this is an incredibly addictive game. It is a real one more go game. Whenever you finish it you think oh, I'm going to have another go and see if I can get further, see if I can complete any more of these caricature pictures that appear in the game. And the caricature pictures are really really good. They're all popular figures that were in the news at the time. So it starts off with Ronald Reagan and then goes on to Margaret Thatcher. And I must admit in playing it recently I haven't got any further than that so I'm not sure what pictures are next. On the loading screen there's some hints that there are people like Alan Sugar. So I'm sure there are a lot more really good character chewers. It's one of those games that it's really hard to describe why it is so addictive. It's a puzzle game and solving the puzzle is a big part of the game and thinking I could have done better in that puzzle and working out new strategies for how to solve the puzzle. The gameplay mechanic itself is really really simple. It's not very complex. There's not a lot to do. There's not really a lot to think about. You have to think about where you move your tiles around and how 
how you move them around. Yet, this is one of those games where those simple elements just add up to give you something a whole lot more interesting and complicated. If there's one thing some games do that really spoils them, and I'm struggling to think of an example, it's over egg the pudding. They put too much in. If anything, my criticism of just general modern games would be that I don't want a controller where I need six buttons on my right thumb, an analog stick and a direction pad on my left thumb, and 15 trigger buttons and buttons on the thumbsticks as well. It's just ridiculous. And This game doesn't do that. If anything, the cracks that appear in the side might be overcomplicated it slightly. I'd rather not have them because, as I said, they're annoying, but they, they add a, something to it and they probably balance the gameplay mechanic just the right amount. But that's a very, very small criticism. And the gameplay is still really, really nicely balanced. The puzzle is a nice challenge. It's nicely balanced gameplay. If I had to criticise one thing in the game, it would be the general control. The uh, cursor moves around a bit fast and it can feel awkward sometimes to try and get hold of the pieces to move them around. You soon get used to this and I I'd encourage anyone who plays this and finds that to persist for a while and keep going at it because you do, you do get used to it. It does get easier as you go on. This is another one of those games that I think would make a great modern remake on an iPad or an iPhone or some touchscreen device. You could see that you could just tap the box in the top left hand corner to deliver a piece and swipe a piece in the direction that you want it to go to move it. Again, if anyone knows of a remake, please let me know. I'd love to download it. I'd certainly pay for it. So that's Split Personalities, a real time sink of a game that once you start playing you really will get sucked into. If you haven't played it, I'd encourage you to download it from the World of Spectrum website and give it a go. So until next time, happy gaming! Having created the map generator last month, Jason's next task was to make a proper character and a movement system. The robots he created had animated eyes, and are currently created using bin statements in the basic listing. These use zeros and ones to depict the image, so it's easy to edit them if required later. Having only an 8 pixel square though, made it impossible for the graphics to replicate the arcade, but he did the best he could. He gave the main character a two stage animation, and the frame was toggled using the not statement. This is a quick and dirty way of doing it, but considering it's only two frames of animation, it works really well. Next was collision and how to check if the player had run into a wall. This was done using the attributes, so each time a player moves, a check is done to see if the background attribute has changed. If they have, it triggers the death routine. The death routine resets the player position, clears any attributes, and generates a border effect using out 254. During this, the character ink is rechosen at random. At the moment for movement, the game uses the ink keys command to pick up key presses. The main disadvantage of this is it can only detect one key at a time, meaning there could be no diagonal movement. He remembers using the in command in his early days of programming to overcome this, so this code will need modifying at some point. To mark the edges of the maze, he created a checkboard pattern and used that as the wall to stop the player from exiting. It was around this point that he noticed that the random ink change wasn't working properly, so more research needed there. Jason also checked on the type of robots the arcade had, and discovered that there were two versions of the game. He decided to go for version 1, the simplest, which only had three types of robot. Jason will continue development next month. Anyone starting a small business or wanting to use their Spectrum for a bit of serious work, there are three basic requirements, a word processor, a spreadsheet and a database. The Spectrum had a variety of these in different packages, but database software decided to produce an all-in-one package containing all of them, plus a graphics program, and named it Mini Office. With so much included, there had to be a manual, and the one that comes with it is small. In fact, it's very small, almost miniaturised but it does cover the basics to get you started. The four programs are loaded separately, so let's start with the word processor. The main menu provides several basic controls, including changing the character set, editing in large or small text mode, loading, saving and printing. It's all a bit sparse, but I suppose it does the job. 
Once in the edit mode, you can type away, and the program displays the word count and remaining memory. There is a basic copy function, and a page layout that is limited to 32 characters only. Yes, it's a very basic word processor, and probably something that you could write in basic if you had a few hours spare. It is, though, a quick and dirty option, that comes with other business tools. Quickly onto the database then, and once loaded, the main menu looks simple enough, allowing you to create a new database, load or save an existing one, and do various things like searching or listing. Setting up a database is very easy. You are guided through the process step by step. First you are asked how many fields you want, up to a maximum of 12. You are then asked to identify each field providing a name, field type, which can be string or number, and the field length. If you are happy, you can continue and start to enter your data. Adding records is fast and easy. You are given each field name and simply enter the data that you want. Depending on how many fields you've chosen and how long each field is, you will be limited to a maximum number of records, and this is displayed from the main menu. Once you have some data, you can then begin to use the other functions. You can use the search, which will search fields for text, but it is case sensitive, which is a bit of a pain really. You can sort all of the fields and list them to screen or printer. Like the word processor then, it's all very basic, but it does the job. Being limited to around 300 records could restrict its use though. Next we have the spreadsheet, and the first thing you have to do is load or create a file. You are asked how many columns you want and how many rows, and you then get the familiar spreadsheet view. Here the columns are already filled with data, that are numeric, and there doesn't seem to be an option to enter text. So I'm guessing it's a calculation program really. Next you would probably want to set up some column headings, and this is where things get a bit messy. First you have to move to the column, and then press C, and then type in the column name, and you have to do this for each column. Once you've done all this though, you can start to add formulas. You do this by moving to the field that wants the result of the formula, pressing F and entering the formula, in the usual manner. The program is clunky to use, but I suppose it does its job, and I suppose it's like the rest of the programs. It can be a bit slow too, if you have a lot of columns, but we are talking about a spectrum here. On to the last program then, and graphics. And here we can load in our spreadsheet and produce graphs. This is quite a nice feature, I think. Once loaded, you are asked which fields you want to include, and are given various options to display the data. This isn't actually bad, and certainly helps to visualise the data in your spreadsheet. There are three types of graphs you can use, and this can be viewed or printed, and you can also take a quick overview of the data being used to draw them. So overall, then, it's a pretty basic offering that would suit a beginner, but the lack of features would rule out any serious business use. I suppose it was aimed at the younger end anyway, and for fairly basic operations, it does its job. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.